My mom was the sort of person to look like a wallflower until you got close and then spout out facts about her favorite animal. It was an emperor penguin. She said their journey for love and parenthood was the hardest and most connecting with her. I'm told all the usual things about her. She had a smile that could light up a room. Her laugh cut through the malaise of an awkward party. Her stride was confident and her form was elegant. From the day I could understand what it was to be remembered, she was painted to me as a true goddess. After all, aren't all moms supposed to be that to their children growing up? Mom died when I was four. Aggressive cancer riddled her body with tumors, stole her stride, her smile, her laugh. Everything in just 18 short months. I didn't see her for much of it. But if I did, I obviously didn't remember. I heard somewhere we don't start forming memories until we're around two years old, and implicit memories, those unconscious memories that stick with us automatically, aren't even until we're seven. So, essentially my mother was already dead for three years before I could even unconsciously think of the word mom and go to her face. A face that was stolen from me. A face that I'll never see. I'm giving you this background information now because it's vital that you understand my mom before we get into the thick of it. I can't sit here and tell you I loved my mom unconditionally. I didn't know her. Dad was never in the picture, so grandparents were where I was shipped off to. Good people. Kind people. They raised me on stories of my mom and made sure to do the one thing she'd requested when her sickness finally got her. Show Nick the milestone tapes. For those unaware, a milestone tape is something where a loved one, usually a parent, records a loving video to congratulate their kin on a moment they're missing out on. First day of school, marriage, you get the picture. I remember being five years old, I had not long tripped on the stairs after miscalculating my steps and smashed my front tooth on the top step, sending my first baby tooth flying. Thankfully, the pain was short-lived in my mind. I was mere days from my birthday and a surprise trip to Disneyland was coming up. In the middle of packing, I was sat down in front of the TV with my grandpa Mihail and him putting in these pristine discs, a gaudy logo flashing up on the screen, still burned into my retinas to this day. Gone, but not deleted, a video message from Lenora Stankowski. The image would flicker for just a moment always just a moment each time, then she'd appear. A young woman sat in a black leather armchair with a small table to her side and patterned wallpaper behind her. She was in her late 20s, with her raven black hair tied in a messy bun, strands curled and dangling down her porcelain face, a beauty mark sitting just beneath her right eye, the pair of them shining like emeralds that caught the first ray of sunshine. Black lipstick gave way to shimmering teeth and a smile that made even an oblivious little me feel lost. Hi, pumpkin. It's mommy. I hope my little prince is watching the throne while I'm away. How can you be nearly six years old and already losing your baby teeth? You're growing up too fast, little man. She puffed out her cheeks as she feigned a frown before giggling. My heart sank in my chest. I knew something wasn't right even then. Her tone was playful, buoyant, and full of joy, like she'd never missed a moment of my life. Now make sure you put your tooth under your pillow tonight. Deda Mihail will make sure the tooth fairy comes and nothing else. She raised a single finger with a wink, posing for a moment before her face fell. Her posture sank, and she fell back into the armchair a tad, growing smaller as she coughed. After a moment, she cleared her throat with a quiet dignity and made sure the hand she coughed into went out of shot as she fixated on the camera with a weak smile. Mommy loves you, my little crown prince. Close your eyes and breathe with me. I looked at my grandfather and with tears streaming down his face and a bite on his lip, he put a hand on my shoulder and nodded. I did as I was told and took a long breath in, the air cold and filling my lungs, intoxicating me as I heard her words. The same words I'd come to hear at the end of every video she recorded. 
I'll always be with you. And so it went. For every milestone I undertook, there was an accompanying video. When I graduated middle school, when I rode my first bike, even when I broke my first bone, she had a video ready. I was around 11 when biking home from school, I collided with a speeding driver. The bastard didn't even stop as my small body careened over his windshield, rolled over the hood, and smashed into the concrete, tearing my right arm to pieces. Passers-by said it was a freak accident, that the car just appeared out of nowhere and then vanished. But hell, what do hit-and-run drivers do? Speed, speed, speed. Medicated up to my eyes and sitting in the hospital, Grandpa handed me a mini DVD player and the familiar face shot up. I could never tell you in those earlier videos if these were done back to back or months apart, but mom still looked radiant, albeit with more coughing in each iteration. Hi pumpkin, it's mommy. Though I'm sure by now you're probably cringing at the mere mention of me referring to myself that way. Oh god, do people still say cringe? It's hard to know what the world you're in is like anymore, but moms are never supposed to be cool, are they? She chuckled, a faraway look in her eye as the pit of my stomach expanded. No, I thought, tears in my eyes, gripping the sheets with my good hand. I want you to say those things. I want you to embarrass me. I thought, well, if you're watching this, then you've broken your first bone. I hope it's a bit later in life and not when you're so upset you can't even hear me. But sweetie, this is an important life lesson that I wanted to be there for. Pain happens. It's a part of our world and everyone in it must experience it. Sometimes it's physical, like now when your body hurts so much that you want to yell and cry out. Sometimes it's emotional, which you get when someone upsets you, hurts your feelings. Something you might also feel from seeing my face right now, which I'm sorry for. She trailed off, that weak smile plastered across her face like the greatest lie ever told. She took a breath, and I heard the quivers in her voice, both from sadness and from sickness. But you're my little crown prince, and while you're watching the throne, I know you'll do great things and overcome anything that stands in your way. You know why? Why? I breathed, my body radiating with hot pain, but my heart aching. I leaned in as she leaned in, like sharing a secret only we would ever know. Because you're my son, and my love for you will push you to do anything. She whispered, my face involuntarily growing into a smile without even realizing. Just don't look at the wall behind me. My eyes were fixed on hers, a small sliver of the background visible behind her ear. As my eyes slowly broke from her gaze and traveled over, she spoke again. Don't! A frantic whisper escaped her lips. My eyes snapped back as a pale shade shifted out of sight. Blinking once, I saw she was sitting back in the chair, talking as if nothing had happened. Had I dozed off? I was on high pain medication. It wasn't impossible. I'm running out of time. These are only supposed to be short, so I'll finish up here. Mommy loves you, my little crown prince. Close your eyes and breathe with me. Again, I did as instructed, and heard a distinct creaking sound from the speakers, undoubtedly her settling into her chair. I'll always be with you. So the years went, and fewer milestone videos popped up. Some of them were simply mundane, or not that noteworthy, not why we're here. But the usual events, first day as a freshman, last day as a senior, prom night, and even an embarrassing one, wherein a 17-year-old me had the most uncomfortable 15 minutes of being explained dating etiquette and safe sex by my long-gone mother. By the time I'd reached 21, only four tapes remained. 
Grandpa Mihail had passed and Grandma Sousa was getting on, so they were given to me with the obvious instruction to not watch them until the time was right. And this is the part where things take a turn. A bad breakup, bad life choices, even worse friendship choices with substances readily available, a lifetime of insecurity stemming from no parental figures, all the love in the world to my grandparents, but it's not the same. And a series of videos from your long dead mom are enough to screw anyone up. So I grabbed a bottle, some pills and put the next video in, planning to binge them before I took my leave. I mean, screw it. What's the harm if I'm ending it all, right? The video flickered and cast a long shadow across my dismal apartment before the visage of my mom came into focus. It'd been a couple of years since the last video, and in my emotionally unstable, drunken state, I wasn't prepared for what I saw. Emaciated, sunken eyes and a slack jaw, her tongue hanging out and drooping to the bottom of her chin. Thick, pungent saliva with her concave chest heaving under the weight of the oxygen machine wrapped around her face. A looming shadow with two bright blue orbs for eyes and jagged pillars for teeth, wrapping its arms around her. It locked eyes with me and cocked its head to the side. No. It croaked, my skin bubbling with fear and chilling my blood. I'd never felt a terror like it. It felt like it knew me and saw into me. I recoiled and in my cocktail of fear and horror, retched up everything I downed not 10 minutes earlier. A torrid mixture of bile, acid, pills and booze spread over my carpet as tears ran down my face. My stomach ached and every cell in my body screamed at me in protest. The thoughts swirling in my thick skull were that of disappointment, disgust and repulsiveness. I felt weak, alone and broken as I collapsed onto the floor in the fetal position sobbing. Sweetie, it's mom. Through blurred eyes and a haze of pain, I looked at the TV, half expecting some emaciated creature to lurch through. But there was my mom. She looked tired, her hair now matted to her head and exhaustion racking her bones. But beauty radiating through her as she held her hands in her lap and leaned forward, smiling. If you're watching this, then things are bad. I don't know how bad, but I can guess. Grandpa wouldn't have let you watch this if you'd gotten your heart broken or were at that age where emotions are as high as a kite and just as volatile. So I can assume that, much like me, you're in a bad place. She coughed and I felt the need to sit up and give her my full attention. This woman, no more than six years my senior, frozen in time, still finding ways to command my attention with her every word. It was like I was five again. Sweetie, I know I can't just talk to you like a child anymore, so I won't. Honestly, I'd been so excited to see you grow up, go through that phase where we bicker and argue over small things before finally settling in the longest and most beautiful phase of our family dynamic. I watched her lips quiver and eyes glaze over, my own mirroring as she shakily concluded. The one where we're best friends, who always look out for each other. That broke me. Every emotion I trained myself to hide away when kids started asking questions I couldn't answer. Situations I'd wanted my mom in. Moments I felt alone. I let it all out. In one volatile evening of self-healing, the words on that tape echoing in my head long after it stopped playing. The road ahead will be tough without me. It was always going to be. But you're the crown prince, and you'll eventually have that throne, survey your kingdom, 
and know you can do anything and conquer anything. It's getting closer now, but we still have some time left. So don't let whatever is going on beat you, nor the thing after that. The penguins didn't, did they? I'm sure Grandpa told you, but they're my favorite. Those little birds share the burden of parenthood, walk over a hundred miles, and nearly starve to cultivate new life. I do all of that and more for you, honey. Because she closed her eyes, and I did too without prompting. We said it together. I'll always be with you. It took time to get better. All things do. I'd spend so many nights in withdrawal with the shakes, vomit, and staring up at a horrific beast looming over my bed, like the thing on TV, but foggier. It'd imitate my movements and try to get closer. With every step, its eyes would glow just a bit brighter, everything else remaining shrouded in darkness, even if light passed through my curtains. I don't know how I made it through that time in my life. One night, as it made its way to the foot of my bed, I closed my eyes and breathed on instinct, reciting my mother's mantra. I suppose in moments of crisis, we turn to our most personal coping mechanisms, and I wasn't about to go back to the bottle. When I finished, it was gone. Over the years, I completed my program, got clean, and went through therapy to cope with the grief. When I hit 26, I met the second most important woman in my life, Natalie. She knew what it was to go through pain, to go through suffering alone, to play with the wrong demons. We fell in love, we got engaged, and eventually married. As she had been countless times before, mom was there to congratulate us. Natalie had seen some tapes, but this was her first one that in its own way was directed to her. Mom was nearing the end by this point, her thin frame barely clinging to her always beautiful dresses, and her skin beginning to stretch like paper. She took great gulps of air from the oxygen tank before talking, but somehow retained that exuberance she'd always had. I knew you'd find someone wonderful eventually, Nick. Penguins always find their mate for life, and you'd be no exception. She giggled through strained coughs, turning her head slightly, as if she could see Natalie. I don't know you but I bet you're the most beautiful woman in the world if my crown prince chose you. Well, after me, of course. Another laugh, this time accompanied by tears from the two of us. There's just one more to go. So look after each other, love well, and experience everything you can. And don't forget. Natalie gripped my hand with her left, and we closed our eyes not wanting to ruin the moment. I'll always be with you. We were so excited to have a baby. Natalie had come from a big family and was eager to start expanding our own. Even though I was a little reluctant, I couldn't help but share in her enthusiasm when so many late nights were spent fawning over baby names, cute outfits, and lofty plans for the future on how our kid would even behave around us determined to be cool parents. But in between all of that, my mind would cast back to those tapes of my mom, the only parent I really knew. I wanted to use them as a guidebook for my own steps. She'd been such an integral part of my life. It seemed odd to not have her in it now. Keeping the last tape separate, I rewatched the entire set one by one, reliving those moments I couldn't truly appreciate until my own burgeoning journey into parenthood. But when I got to the broken bone tape, I froze. Once again, she leaned into the camera and whispered, eyes full of fright and panic. Don't look. I pushed pause on the video and took a moment. Surely I was just highly medicated at the time, 
There couldn't really be anything there, right? So why was I so reluctant to move my eyes to the right to find out? Taking a breath, I moved the video frame by frame and watched the corner where her face didn't cover. That shadow, that same shadow looming in the background, eyes burning red with fury. Don't look, don't look, don't look, don't look. I jumped. The video was skipping, stuck on the sounds of my mother's panic-stricken voice begging me not to stare. But I couldn't help it. I stared, and I watched this creature take confident, unnatural, and twitchy strides from the background, getting even closer to the camera. I saw the muscles on its face twitch as it pressed its cheeks up into a twisted grin, the sight of rot and earth and unspeakable things in its mouth, all displaying themselves in full glory. As it intonated one word that sent screams through my home before shutting off. Soon. Natalie was eight months gone, petite, and a history of prior drug abuse. They said her heart just couldn't take it, her body gave out, and that it was a miracle our daughter survived. I took it all in, and yet none of it, as I cradled my entire universe in my arms, the second greatest woman I'd ever known now taken from me too. Phoebe, I breathed unable to take my eyes off her perfect little face as she slept soundly just 12 feet from her dead mother. Her name is Phoebe, and she is the crown princess. Somewhere in the corner of my eye, a shadow cast itself over Natalie's bed, right as they put the sheet over her. From that night on, there would always be noises outside our home, always faint howling, always a solitary spot in the front of the property where no light could touch it. For a while, I forgot about the videos, forgot about everything that wasn't Phoebe. Raising her became priority number one, and I'd work any extra hours I needed to, give up any friendship I had to, and spite myself in whatever way was necessary to ensure that my perfect girl slept soundly at night. It wasn't until Phoebe's second birthday last week that I finally got the courage to dig out the videos and watch the last one. How many times had I sat in a home, emotionally destroyed and at a crossroads in my life, waiting to see this woman's face and hope she'd somehow have the magic words to guide me? As the picture flickered on, the logo shining up on screen, I cast my head back with a mixture of surprise and sadness as I realized the significance of the year. I was older than her now. Hi, sweetie. I guess we finally reached the end, huh? Her voice sounded younger. I looked down and saw her standing up, no chair or wallpaper in sight. It looked like she was recording this in her bedroom, a picture of health, all things considered. Her eyes red from crying, but her voice unwavering, like she'd prepared these words carefully. This is technically the final video for you, but the first for me. Weird how this all works, but this is how it needs to happen. If you're watching this, you've got your own little princess to protect. The crown prince has now become the king, and I couldn't be prouder. She beamed, but my stomach tightened at those words. Your own little princess. I breathed, my chest tightening. How did she know? I imagine you're now wondering how I know. Well, that's not the important part. What's important is if you saw what you think you saw. Within the videos, between the frames, there's something lurking here, Nick. Something ancient. 
I felt the house shudder, settling into place no doubt, but I couldn't separate myself from the fear running through my body. It feeds on misfortune. It watches from the shadows and waits for small tiny windows to make itself known. I don't know where it came from or what it is, but I know what it wants. A rumbling behind me, the sound of wood splintering and creaking, the unmistakable sound of tapping that I'd heard every time we did the mantra at the end of a video. I was shaking, but I didn't stop watching. It wants us, Nick. We seem to be a source for it. When it finishes using us, it moves on. A long time ago, I was told that if I captured it in film, solidified it in these repeatable tapes, it would slow it down, maybe even stop it. I have no idea if it'll work, but you deserve to know now that you can almost certainly see it too. Because if it doesn't stop here, if you start to see it, start to experience misfortune. My heart skipped, tripping over the stairs and narrowly missing cracking my skull as a child, losing my first tooth, the hit and run that shattered my arm, my first broken bone, marrying and losing Natalie, my first love. Oh my God. I willed my body to move, to leap out of the seat and rush to Phoebe's room, but I had to hear the rest through, screaming at my mom to tell me the solution. When your Deda Mihail told me about our curse, how he took me in after my father died, about how it passes from father to daughter, mother to son, and so forth, you can try to avoid it, but it always finds a way. She looked down in shame, clutching at her sleeves. Truth be told, I didn't want to get pregnant, but things have a way of happening and I knew I couldn't give you up. She glanced behind her, something off camera scaring her into grabbing at her arms and rubbing them, shame and fear on her face. I'm so sorry, baby, but I want you to know that there is a power in these words in these videos, I will do everything I can to protect you, just like I know you'll protect your child, no matter who it hurts in the process, because… One last time, I just had to close my eyes one last time, and it would all be over. I did it on instinct. It didn't matter that there was a slew of sounds alerting me to an invading presence in my home, that it was rapidly approaching me. All that mattered was the mantra. But what I heard was not my mother. I'll be here for you. Always. A guttural inhuman voice barked back the phrase and I swear I felt its breath inches from my face. I felt eyes unrestricted by pupils or sockets spin around, focusing on my weakest point, but I didn't waver. After a few agonizing moments, it darted away and out of view, leaving only the static of the TV to keep me aware that I wasn't in fact dreaming. As soon as I knew it was safe, I ran to Phoebe's room and checked on her, convinced that she was next in a long line of losses, convinced that some otherworldly specter had taken her from me, convinced I would be alone again. You can imagine my relief when I opened the door to find her softly sleeping, clutching her teddy bear with his own attached blankie, the same toy my mom had given me. I looked at her with the enormity of the situation overshadowing me, the realization that she was the same age I was when my mom got diagnosed, the realization that soon I would be the one making a slew of videos for milestones, my crown princess's kingdom of nightmares.
and I don't know if this is what my mother intended, but I took those words at the end to heart. Protect your child, no matter who it hurts in the process. I'm sorry, everyone. I don't know how this translates across mediums, but there is power in describing an old and malevolent force, just like there is seeing it in the corner of your eye or when you experience a lucky break from death, a misstep here, and a wrong turn there. You'll always see it. My mother gave up everything to buy time, give me the chance to right the wrong and find a better way, a way that involves my daughter growing up with her father in her life, without the plague of whatever this is hanging over either of us. Maybe you won't be the one. Maybe it'll simply look at you and find you not to its liking, as it did me that fateful night, inches away from my flesh and determining that I simply wasn't ripe enough yet. But someone will come across this, and it will bite. It will bite and never let go, be it nightmares, sleep paralysis, a slew of unfortunate mishaps, or something flitting in the corner of your eye, it'll be there, whatever it is. Waiting. I wish you well, and I hope you don't judge me too harshly. But to me and to Phoebe, family is everything. So close your eyes and take a deep breath because they'll always be with you.